up, guys? Welcome to the first episode of the Levers Podcast. I'm one of your levered lads. Tej with me are Sam, a.k.a. Shake, and Chris, a.k.a. Crisp. We've assembled here to do what we've always done, which is to just riff about topics and opportunities and that interest us at the time. Uh, in both those kind of categories, uh, the key to us is finding um, what we like to refer to as levers. And these levers are kind of hidden in the tapestry of life. Uh, leverage is, is, is that capacity to amplify, right? It's getting more out than the resources you've put in. And um, we think the, the kind of more colloquial definition of leverage fits under this umbrella quite nicely. So, you know, traditionally when we think about leverage, it's let's leverage this resource uh, to some ends, right? And the idea is you're striving to gain more back from that resource, from its use, than the time or money you put into it. If the resource didn't give you that leverage, then you wouldn't be leveraging the resource in the first place. So life's levers, by kind of their nature, are mostly veiled, right? Else they would have been exploited by someone else. Uh, you know, the, the uh, lowest hanging fruits are going to be plucked pretty much immediately. So with that, um, we hope that our ramblings may enable you to find some of your own leverage, or if they don't do that, at least spark some intrigue and maybe some humor. With that, let's bang on. Yeah, so the three of us, we all met at Wash U. Uh, we were in the same fraternity. We quickly became best friends because we had a similar orientation to life. As Teach kind of pointed out, uh, we we're kind of unknowingly looking for these levers, um, trying just to get the most out of life. Uh, we had similar backgrounds. We all played sports growing up, played the best one, basketball. Uh, and uh, we also were kind of similar students where we could get good grades, but we were kind of distracted, occasionally ditched class. Uh, and we also had similar interests. I mean, we were just 19 year olds, so we didn't know much, but we liked economics, philosophy, language, psychology, all that, you know, good abstract stuff. And uh, so we've stayed in touch the last eight years. Uh, we're always talking in our group chat about ideas, methods, hacks, kind of looking for that leverage. Um, and recently, we kind of realized that this has been an ongoing thing for us and uh, very productive and valuable as we just kind of share in our conversation. So we decided we want to document it and transcribe it and kind of make this uh, ongoing exploration uh, more open so that we can get more people in on it and it hopefully will catalyze uh, our search. So yeah, there's three reasons we're doing this. One, we want to catalyze our own exploration of levers. We're hoping that as we put out content, we'll inspire other people's riffs and their own adventures looking for levers. And three, we just want to generate copious amounts of humor. So uh, <laughs> we can do individual bios. Uh, so I'm Chris, aka Crisp, aka Little Hack. I grew up in Chicago. I uh, my main things were math and basketball. Uh, more basketball, and now my revisionist history is that I was into math. Um, at school, I studied finance and business, but uh, at any given time, I was just kind of reading what I was most interested in. So then I went into consulting because that was kind of the uh, well-trodden path. I hated consulting. So uh, I, after I did an internship, I decided I wanted to try to get into tech. So I went out to Santa Barbara, worked for a startup called Graphic, got into software engineering. Uh, we were acquired by Amazon. I worked uh, for the big Stripe machine for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I recently quit because um, although I learned a lot about engineering, it was tough working in a hierarchy uh, that's very ordered and you're expected to do what you're told to do. And if you can tell by my presentation right now, I kind of like riffing, so I didn't fit in. So now I'm on the uh, I'm on the search for something entrepreneurial, hopefully um, with AI and crypto are my main interests, which as tropey as that is. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Sam, aka Shake. Um, I grew up in West LA, and I went to Wash U um, to play football. And uh, 
and pursue some some academic topics. Um, and I studied psychology, some philosophy, and uh, and business. Um, most recently, I was I was living in St. Louis. I actually just moved uh, about five days ago back to Los Angeles. But I was I was living in St. Louis as a uh, as an IT recruiter. Uh, so I would try to re recruit people like Chris, um, you know, software developers and stuff. And so, and now I'm going to be working remotely for this AI enabled startup, which is kind of funny now that I think about think about it what just Chris just said but yeah outside of work um I'm going to be fo I focus on this podcast and I have another podcast with my girlfriend Shaney called Nuance and Nonsense and um I've taken a uh deep dive into the world of cryptocurrency which I know we'll be talking about on here too but um yeah that's kind of what I spend my time doing what's up guys I'm TJ family and friends call me Tej um I grew up outside New York City in a small town called Pelham. Uh, I was playing soccer constantly. That um, that kind of made up my identity. Um, Chris had mathematics to some extent, was mainly basketball. I had all soccer. It was me. Um, I met these top lads at Wash U. We were all in the same fraternity. Uh, I studied Chinese and finance. Um, and I really actually loved both. I still love both, um, but I hated the way both were taught. So I ended up pursuing them um, in my own way on the side extracurricularly and still today. Right after school, um, I went and traded real estate bonds for two years. And then amidst the global pandemic in July of 2020, I quit that uh, for similar reasons, I think, to um, what Chris was talking about, uh, bureaucracy and hierarchy were not my forte. Um, I'd like kind of a bit more freedom than that. So if quitting, you know, a salary job during a pandemic wasn't enough uncertainty, I hopped over to Istanbul for three months and did a little stint there. And now I'm back to increase longevity and, and stack sats with the lads. Um, with that, Let's uh, let's dive into this thing. So we talked a little bit about leverage, which is the idea behind this pod. Let's talk about, um, let's break down what a lever really is, right? At its core, a lever is a tool that magnifies a given input of force. So examples in the real world, an actual lever, right? A, a stick or a lever that's manipulated about a fulcrum, right? So think like a seesaw, um, which is offset. A crowbar, right, to jimmy open or open a locked, a tightly locked container. A bottle opener or a baseball bat. Similarity with all these tools is by manipulating a lever about a fulcrum, a hinge point, you can create a longer lever arm that re requires a very little amount of force to lift a very heavy weight on the other side of the fulcrum. Um, a term we very well may return to um, is this idea of mechanical advantage. And that's basically the output force divided by the input force, the amount of leverage that a lever gives you. So using these levers, a very small force can create a huge one. Um, the problem is without a lever, without access to a lever, without the means to find or build a lever, it's only those entities, whether it's a company, an individual, a government, it's only those entities with a lot of power already at their disposal, the incumbents that can generate those large returns. Without the lever, the small are gonna be crowded out by the large. So I think a nice little, uh, a nice little pithy quote um, comes from Archimedes, who is a Greek physicist, mathematician, inventor, and engineer is, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. So with a long enough lever, anything can be moved by anyone. All right, so let's hop out of the clouds and slither into the real world here. Um, so some examples of levers in the real world. So a physical lever is where we'll start, right? To, to bridge the transition. Um, it's an entity or protocol that delivers you more physical impact than the cost to run it. So I think a great example is fasting, um, as in abstaining from food. What's the cost of it? Well, it has very little cost. It's sort of the antithesis of a cost. You're spending no money and you're eating no food. So maybe the cost is discomfort. And what it delivers back to you is um, more efficient resource allocation to living cells, to new cells, fat loss, honing of your senses, 
you gain back the time that would have been allocated to eating and prep time. And of course you save money. So another category we have is this idea of a labor lever, right? If you own a stake in a productive enterprise, you have labor leverage. You have a group of employees, they're working for you, their work, their output accrues to you in the form of earnings. So this form of leverage, a labor lever, magnifies your financial input, assuming the enterprise is successful. You're just as exposed to failure of that enterprise. Magnification. You can be at work or at home, awake or sleeping. If your enterprise is productive, cash still flows to you. So moving on to my one of my favorite forms of leverage, we've got this idea of a financial lever. A financial lever is a, an instrument, a financial instrument or a security or a capital structure or really any you know, financial manipulation that you can think of that exposes you as a stakeholder to more risk and thus reward for a given amount of capital, for a given amount of money you put in. So a good example to keep with um, the vein of this uh, productive enterprise is if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a business, you can use all of your own cash to do so or you can take out a loan, other people's money added to your own money. In this case, if the business succeeds, that entrepreneur, you in this case, have a better ratio of the earnings that come back to the initial investment of your cash that you put in. Now the entrepreneur is equally exposed to any downside. Again, the lever magnifies all effects. Finally, um, to nicely embody what this podcast is, what type of lever this podcast is, we have informational levers. This is a structure of information or a medium for its distribution that magnifies the reach of that information. So this is a super interesting idea. Um, examples are the printing press, um, Gutenberg, a megaphone, the internet, software code, a book, or a podcast. So with that, let's uh, let's ride. Cool. So um, yeah, the lever that uh, you know we were brainstorming. Um, I was on my drive to LA, right? And we were thinking of what to talk about on the first episode. And um, I was thinking about minimalism because I had just had to, you know, throw away a bunch of my own stuff and Shaney's um, and pack our, you know, pack my sedan to move across the country. And so um, that's the one we're going to be kind of discussing today, some topics within minimalism. How is it a lever and, you know, how maybe each of us use it or, or plan to use it in our lives. So, um, I think most people are going to have an idea of what minimalism is in a general sense. But uh, when I was doing some research, I just wanted to look up a definition for it. So this is how Merriam-Webster defines minimalism, a style or technique that is characterized by extreme spareness and simplicity. Um, so I think that minimalism is at, at the core of a pretty simple uh, lever to understand, or it's pretty simple to understand how Minimalism, minimalism is a lever. Um, but basically the, the way that I kind of summed it up was live simply and thus experience more optionality and freedom. So it's kind of like do less so that you can experience more things. Um, do less, you know, have less, whatever, whatever it might be. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so to kind of outline how it, uh, how I use it in my life recently and kind of this could maybe paint a picture for people how it's a lever um, is when Shaney and I decided to move to Los Angeles, um, leading up to the move, I, well, actually both of us, but speak for myself, I had pretty few things to, um, to, to get rid of and pack. And so because of that, it really took me only, I don't know, a couple days of work to get completely ready to move. Um, whereas like I've moved, let's say my, with my parents before, and that's like, you know, a month long endeavor of, of getting rid of stuff, selling stuff. And basically because I had few belongings in the time leading up to the move, I was able to spend my time elsewhere. And, um, personally I was researching a lot about cryptocurrency and, and I was reading some of this book that, uh, that Chris gave me the sovereign individual. Um, and so it, again, it was just because I had fewer things, I was able to have more freedom when it came time to move, um, this, the basic premise of it. And so, um, think, go ahead. Uh, I think, uh, one thing to point out when we just like talk about minimalism is, uh, you know, as humans, we have this like 
fixed attention span. Um, like we can only in, attend to so many things at one time. And what you kind of realize is there's a limit uh, to, uh, you know, what you can interact day to day. So when people end up accumulating all these things that they own, they're still only using like a small percentage of it each day. And then when they move, I just recently moved too, they realize that like 90 to 95% of the things they own, they never use, never wear, never even play with. So it's like, why do you even own it if, if you don't even use it? And it's because we have this like fixed bandwidth on our attention, right? Like, even if you have a thousand things, if you can only attend to 10 things, like those, you know, the other 999, 990 things are just going to sit there being like, just uh, basically unused. But yeah. Keep like, going. Sorry, a... I cut you off. No, no, this is oh, where, yeah. This yeah. Is where we're going <laughs> to discuss anyways. Um, no, I mean, that's, that's something I, that I've been thinking about too. And it, it's interesting because I, I think that for me, at least like, when I have more things, you're right. It's like, I can only focus on a certain number of them. So what's even the point of having all these extra things, but at any given time, there's like, I'm, I'm having, I'm having maybe to shift what I, what the things I am focused of focus on or aware of, you know, in terms of belongings. Um, and like the, then there's like the time it takes to like shift that focus that you lose, you know? Yeah. Um, like, yeah. like I, like I've always realized like if my, you know, work area is cluttered, it's like, I come in and I feel like I'm, I can't focus because exactly. I, there's all these little things and I'm like having to have a quick thought about each one of them, you know? And, um, so I think, yeah, I think that it, it ties in nicely because it's, like I said, it's really just like doing less or having less so that you can have more. I think we should definitely dive into how. Uh, noise in your physical space generates noise in your psychological space. But I want to add one thing um, to to co collections and belongings. So I think there's like a as as you guys both alluded to, there's like a there's a Pareto distribution in how you use your your possessions, right? Like twenty percent of your possessions get like eighty percent of your attention and use and resources. So like your wardrobe or whatever, right? And I think like the reason that and I, I've been guilty of just having way too much shit in the past, especially wardrobe stuff. Like I, I like to look good. It's, it's one of my, one of my weaknesses, but I think, I think what it comes down to for me at least is I keep all this shit around for, for two reasons. One is, um, there's a sunk cost bias, right? Like I spent my money on it and I have basically all the sunk money in my wardrobe and to just throw it away, you feel like you're doing that you're doing that, that spending a, a disservice, which, which kind of hurts, right? The, yeah. the cl classic sunk cost fallacy. Um, but I think the other thing is like when looking at something, like I think you guys both shed some clothes, at least you, Chris, when looking at something, you're like, I'm probably never going to use this, but in the future, I can envision a time where this thing would be really cool to have. Yeah. And so you're anticipating a loss avoidance. Yeah, um, no, that, and so I, exactly I think it. the combination of those two things is why, like, oftentimes we just keep way too much shit around. And there's a reason both those are, are fallacies or biases, right? Yeah. They're wrong. I, I think it's very easy to imagine the, the benefits to having all this stuff. You're like, if you kind of like took this naive model, like everything you own has a little bit benefit to you. You should just be like, greedy and accumulate as many resources. But then if you come up with this cognitive model where um, you can kind of think you have limited attention and you need to be picking what you attend to, um, you realize that every additional thing you own also has this cost on your psyche. Um, right. You know, when you're having to make up a decision of what you're using, like that's psych a lot, like that's a cognitive burden. So each additional thing you own actually also has that cost and it's easy to forget that cost when we envision using it in the future. Um, and that cognitive cost of picking what we use is actually, I think that's the, um, that's the, that's what leads to the Pareto distribution that you're talking about, right? That's why I use this 80, like 20% of things get 80% of the use is because your brain doesn't want to deal with that cognitive burden. It just wants to like automate right uh the things it's using and so then you end up even if you have all these things 
your your brain in reality is like, oh, we can only use a few of these things because I don't want to be picking what I'm using all the time. That that's too tiring, right? Um, but then when you when you're not in the day to day, like you're saying, you imagine, you know, rocking that really fresh T-shirt or or shoes or what? I mean, whatever. I don't know what you you know what you want to be dressing in, but um, you definitely you do. You definitely do know. <laughs> Definitely yeah, do know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hey, do one of you guys want to um, try to take on and explain if it, for anyone who's listening who, who's not familiar with Pareto's distribution, like or Pareto's law? I think it's called. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, uh, Pareto's distribution came from this. Uh, I think he was Italian, uh, like self-taught yeah, engineer, yeah. economist. Uh, he was basically studying uh, wealth across generations. And he found that uh, kind of ac- universally across time, usually 80% of the wealth is in 20% of people's, um, 20% of uh, the households or people uh, have 80% of the wealth. So it's kind of this, and then people kept studying different phenomena in nature. And they basically found there's like a lot of phenomena like this where uh, some 20% of the group has 80% uh, of the thing that you care about. Um, and it's kind of been formal or another way to describe it is the 80, 20 rule. That's how consultants and like business people always talk about it. And it's just this idea that um, certain parts of uh, distribution, uh, distribution is also like a buzzy word. Um, yeah. Well, if people are familiar with like a, a bell curve, right? That, that's like the most basic distribution where there's more of said, you know, of the characteristic or of the resource, whatever in the, the average, right? Like, um, I don't know. Right. People... Or like a uniform distribution or uh, like a one-to-one mapping. Maybe that's the way I think about it. It's like if every person had the same amount of wealth, like that would be the exact opposite of a Pareto distribution. It'd be evenly distributed across everyone where a Pareto distribution is like you have these huge clumps or clusters and a smaller amount of people. Um, so it's about this like uneven relationship between input and output. I think, um, is the way I think think if people are familiar with like outliers too, I feel like Malcolm Gladwell kind of like, I don't know if he talks specifically about Pareto distribution, but just the idea that there's like a smaller percentage of the population that gets more of a resource, more of results mm-hmm. even. I mean, in the US, it, what's the, isn't it, the US it's even more exaggerated, I think, right? It's like 5% has 90% or something like that. Yeah. The thing is these power right, laws aren't just, aren't just financial. So there's a, our, a Pareto distribution is a type of power law, which in a power law is just this like very uneven relationship between inputs and outputs. Um, and so it shows up everywhere. So there's a, there's a law called Zips law. It has to do with language that certain words show up disproportionately more than any words. And if you think about this, it's kind of obvious. So like the words like the, a, um, and, and of like all these very core words, like articles and prepositions show up way disproportionately more than other words. Like, uh, what's the one I learned yesterday? Zazzle or sozzled. Sozzled means really drunk in the, uh, in like British slang, like that, that word's never showing up relative <laughs> to the, right? So, um, to sazzle? Sozzled. Kind of like sizzle. S O Z Z E L, yeah. I'm pretty hyped for the next time I turn up so I can drop it at the at the parties, you know? <laughs> Sizzled and sozzled. Is the, the next podcast. <laughs> sozzle nozzle. Um, <laughs> sozzle nozzle is a pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> Pretty nice name for the the new uh, the new what is it called the the draft the, the fucking, what's the thing that you pull oh, yeah. out of draft yeah, the, yeah the, draft. like the tap the tap or whatever the tap, tap no. yeah sozzle nozzle tap um but I guess the reason Pareto distribution kind of fits in with like levers is you see these uneven this uneven relationship between inputs and outputs it mirrors that ratio be, for the mechanical advantage between uh, outputs and inputs. So if you you realize something has an 80 20 Pareto distribution, power law type distribution, that's a sign that maybe you should shift the way uh, 
you're interacting with that um with so that would space, you say that phenomena etc you know in a situation where you see a, a 80 20 distribution is it is it uh kind of safe to maybe assume or, or, or look into, oh, there's a lever at use here. Yeah, like, so with the clothing, if you see that your wardrobe is eight, like 20% of the clothes you're wearing 80% of the time, that probably means you don't need the other clothes because you're already not wearing the other clothes, right? Like it, it would yeah. make more sense to keep all your clothes if it was like every, it was an even distribution across what you're wearing. Um, right. Potentially, I mean, it depends what you want. like. If you want to have a giant closet of clothes, you can do that. But um... so this kind of this kind of brings up a topic I, I wanted to get your guys' take on. So um, I watched this documentary on Netflix. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it was about minimalism. It's called The Minimalist or something. Um, and um, this one guy brought up a point though that that to be minimalist, and this is in the sense of your belongings, right? What we're kind of focusing on. Um, that it actually requires like intention and effort to keep fewer objects, you know, in your possession. And so, um, like I said, the way I summarize it was kind of like do less and have more freedom. Right. And I wanted to kind of just flesh that out. Like, okay, yes, you're doing less in practice, but it, that actually might require some effort. Um, and I wanted to see what you guys thought about that. So I think there's, I think that's absolutely true. And it can be, extremely overwhelming for people to deliberately cleave off things they don't need but rewinding i think what tends to happen is your your mind gravitates towards cognitive ease rather than cognitive burden so if you simply observe your behavior over the past year I, y your mind will gravitate towards the possessions um and the things and the clothing um, that makes the most sense. That is a necessity. So you end up using those 20% of the things 80% of the time. All it takes is the mindfulness to realize that's the stuff you're using and the rest of the stuff needs to be cleaved. So I think to some extent, it is a tricky task to just stop, sit, and cut off the unnecessary. But I think if you pay attention, your mind has already done the work for you. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Chris, what do you think? The balance of like that, you know, you're you're doing less, but it requires effort to do less. It's kind of a weird, I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. It's not like just doing less is easy because um, constraint can be hard. I think, for me, I think willpower is a bit overrated in that um, there's an idea that like, if you just have a lot of willpower, that's how you have discipline. Um, so in this case, it'd be like, oh, I'll just at every second, I will um, stop myself from uh, buying new things or something, right? Or you just are constantly showing willpower. I think the real trick is to like design a life environment where you try to reduce the constant need to enforce um, and have willpower. So the example with like food and fasting is, um, if you want to fast and you have a fridge full of really good food, it's going to be a lot harder than if when you go to the grocery store, you like, you only buy the healthy food. Like that's, that's the like archetypal, like design an environment that's easy to diet. So, um, I think there is something similar. You can do similar things with, uh, uh, minimalism that where you try to, uh, kind of set up an environment that you inhabit that makes it easier to stick with minimalism. Um, yeah. So I'm yeah. trying to think yeah. of how, how you do that with uh, owning less stuff. I mean, you could get a, no one would do this, but you, for example, you could buy a really small house. <laughs> right? Dude, I, that's I, that's I, like, I, well, that's me right now. I'm living bro, in a bro, small I, house with three people. I, I, Ikea, Ikea just came out with mini houses on trailers for $49,000 for millennials. Mm. Really? See? It's just, Dude, it, it's, yeah. a dope, it's a dope, it's a dope Scandinavian minimalist trailer. It's black. It's big inside. It has everything you need from soup to nuts, kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, $49,000. Like, you know, yeah. in a, in a, in an aggressively hyper consumerist, you know, um, 2021, like some millennials, I could see 
there, there's got to be some minimalist backlash that people are just like, you know, begging for. Like, we, I was digging into the minimalism a little bit this weekend. Um, at least in architecture, uh, minimalism has has its roots in sort of two places. One is Japanese Zen philosophy, and the other one is the Bauhaus movement out of out of post World War One Germany. But in in the in the Japanese sense, what they were saying is, in the eighties, this idea of Japanese minimalism really um, had its emergence. And it was kind of a backlash against like the rapid urbanization and industrialization coming out of Japan post World War II. Like there was just a absolute boom. And like the end of that obviously resulted in a big property boom, but you, you had this urban chaos, like this just like ridiculous entropy and um, like sort of an, like Upton Sinclair hellscape, right? And then minimalism came out as like the emergent solution to carve out the noise just have what's necessary for sort of a serenity and thought and if you have that embodied like we were talking hey you were talking about um how if your desk is cluttered your mind is cluttered um and i think the same thing sort of applies to to larger architectural systems like if you've got a house that has like it has so much noise in it it's going to be difficult to think or act and to some extent you know, if there's just a whole bunch of stuff in the environment, it's almost like there's like a sort of a determinism to your activity. Like you've got all this stimuli that's just like it's it's um, it's sapping your attention and you, you don't control that. Right. You just you just you glob onto things. And if you take all that stuff out, it's almost like it's, it's more of a blank canvas for you to be really deliberate about um, your behavior, which I like. Yeah. I think um, this comes from a book that uh, Mike and I listened to called Atomic Habits, but he talks about a Ulysses Pact from the uh, from the Odyssey. the story about the yeah the Odyssey, how Ulysses like strapped himself to the to the boat so that he couldn't be attracted to the sirens. I think yeah. just continuing on the minimalism point is. If you can find ways to make one decision that locks in your behavior over the long term, um, that's a good way to force, like, put yourself, design an environment that um, makes it easier to stick with minimalism. So I made the joke about buying a small house, but that's an example of a Ulysses pack where you basically lock yourself into a certain environment that you can't easily change. And then once you add in that constraint, now you're kind of you're kind of locked in. Um, right. you don't have to worry about getting more stuff. And I think that's actually a mental model I use a lot is like, can I make one decision that will constrain my future at like behavior, um, in a valuable way so that all I really need is that what willpower in that one second to be like, I'm going to do this thing. And then once I'm, once I've done it, like I, I can't undo it. And, I, I, um, and I'm kind of making a commitment to myself for the long term to do it. So like. The cheesiest example is like, I was super annoyed with Facebook. I thought it was bad for my mental health. And I just deleted my Facebook account. And like, there was no, <laughs> there was no coming back from that. And then it, it was like, that was like a Ulysses back, right? Like it's done, can't get the Facebook back now. Um, and so it's kind of like, and I think that there's an interesting example of leverage there. It's like in that one moment you put in, you make one decision and then it has this like rippling effect over and over. Yeah um again hey hey what's a uh what's a ulysses pack that that you use to your advantage i was just thinking man um like you you're you're carnivore right so it's kind of like no carb boom done right yeah yeah so okay that, that was actually what i was thinking was like when um and this is i'm something i'm struggling with currently because um my roommate you guys know doms he has a lot of different types of food around here like cake and cookies and this and that <laughs> chips and and you know when i would when i was living um in my old apartment by myself my roommate didn't buy much food but i would uh like i would only have food that was part of my diet so when i was you know doing a carnivore or like low carb thing i just wouldn't even have it in my house and this is actually something in atomic habits he talks about too is like so there would be a barrier for me to like right. cheat on my diet. I would have to go okay. drive to the grocery store and get, you know, ice cream or whatever I was craving. Um, and so it was, you know, so it was just like the, 
what was the, I forget the term you used earlier, but then it was, it was just like the easier, it made it easier to stick to my diet than not to. So it's like, I forget the, what was the term you used? Like cognitive, uh, cognitive burden. Or, Bur- yeah, yeah. Cognitive ease, cognitive burden. Right. So it, so it was actually, um, yeah, it was way easier to stick to my diet. You know, if like all I had in the house was like steak, it's like, okay, I might not want to eat steak again for the hundredth time tonight, but like, it's easy to do and I just do it and I don't have to think about it. Um, whereas now someone I'm struggling with is like, there's all, like, I just walk out and there's like a hundred types of like food that's not healthy. So, yeah. You know, on, on, on that, um, you guys both touched on it that I think the point is, is salient. Willpower is sort of a mirage and it's an illusion. Really disciplined people are just impeccable architects of environment. So when you've got, um, a roommate that, you know, people are going to do their own thing, but if you're living with other people, like we're social animals, if there are temptations around, um, your, your mind will, and it will outsmart you. It will give into those temptations. We were talking about, um, you know, I think we all to some extent do cold showers. Um, and I think the cold shower gives a, a really interesting, um, thought experiment in regards to, um, our motivations. So, the cold shower is on, you get into the bathroom and something interesting happens, at least in my mind, which is um, the mind starts to generate all of these excuses for why you shouldn't be doing that thing. A cold shower is painful. You're, you're willing yourself into pain. So the mind has this amazing mechanism that tries to trick you out of that. And then what's even more amazing than that is as you start to, um, as you start to generate that cowardice or that weakness, the mind immediately backs that weakness up with justifications for why it's okay, right? So just this one time, the cold shower, it's fine. It doesn't make sense. It's not for you. You know, you took a cold shower yesterday. So if, if let's take it back to your environment, right? If there's that like cookie or that cake around and it's just sitting there and you'd like to say, I have the willpower not to, not to go touch that cake, but you know, the the drive for the sugar in that cake is biologically wired. So you better believe that your ego is going to start to generate all of these justifications for why it's okay to go snag those cakes. The only way to get out of that is to remove the cakes, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think Something... that's one lesson you got to, you kind of have to, you have to be very kind of ruthless in how you design your environment yeah. around you. Yeah. I mean, no one likes to be, you don't want to be authoritarian, but the, so like the something, yeah, something I thought of, their environment. something I thought of in regards to like, a, you know, a minimalist, um, you know, house or apartment that I, that I just realized yesterday was like Shaney did when we first got here, we had like our stuff all over the place, trying to find places to store it and everything, all our clothes and, you know, toiletries and everything. And Shaney yesterday took like four hours and put everything like everything has its place now and like the room like looks pretty immaculate you know and because of that it's like i don't it's there's like a barrier to me like throwing my clothes on the floor because it would feel out of place have throwing my clothes on the floor throwing my clothes on the bed right and i think that um that's kind of like that's one way i think i would think about it in terms of your uh you know your working space your living space that could kind of not quite a Ulysses pact, but, but just design the environment so that there's a barrier to accumulating clutter because yeah, that but sure. once you have clothes on the floor, which is, I've done this a lot, or once I have clothes on my bed and I don't want to fold my laundry, then it's like, oh, well, it's not another thing just to throw my shirt on the bed before you know yeah. it, you have like a whole pile of stuff. This has uh, some broken window theory vibes. Are you guys familiar with that? Yeah. Um, no. What's that? The broken windows theory is a criminological theory that states that the visible signs of crime, antisocial behavior, and civil disorder created in an urban environment that encourages further crime and disorder, including serious oh, crimes. Yeah. So, like, once you see one broken window, you think it's okay to, like, for more and more um, kind of uh, illegal behavior. And so it's kind of like those even small things not being how they should be uh, makes it feel like it's okay uh, for yeah. more of it. So in your point, you know, once a few things are on the floor, it's no longer an immaculate floor. So then you feel like you can, <laughs> you can just mess up the whole place. 
Um, the, it's uh, kind of interesting going from 100 to like 90, 99% is like a big difference psychologically. Right. The, um, the broken window hypothesis, I think is like, it fits under the umbrella of, um, of the Diderot effect, which, oh, that was an atomic habits too. Do you guys remember that? Remind me. Nope. So it's just the idea, like in a very specific domain, um, that like, if you, if you buy something, if you buy uh, a product of a given category, it makes it more likely you're going to buy a given product of the same category again, right? So like any activity you give credence to makes it more likely you're going to give credence to it again. And so like, if you've just cleaned your entire environment, it makes it more likely that you're going to continue not to violate that norm. Or like you can think about any, any, any activity or any, any spending of resources. If you do it once, you put inertia into play and you're going to do it again and again and again and vice versa. So if you bring it back to uh, cognitive ease and cognitive burden, like if you're creating barriers to, to bad behavior, you make them very difficult to do. And so you start not doing them and you're not doing them begets more not doing them. And then for the good behaviors, you make them super easy to do. So you're doing them begets more doing them. Um, yeah. Yeah. In uh, atomic habits, he has like a whole thing, like don't break the chain where it's uh uh, this is really just a testimonial for Atomic Habits. James Clear, you can get on our second <laughs> you can get on our yeah. second episode if you're tuning in, which I'm sure you are. Uh, don't break the chain, which is like every day you, you want to, even if it's like you don't do it perfectly, like just keep the habit going because there's a psychological phenomena where if you've done it 30 days in a row, you're more likely to do it than if you've done it zero days in a row. Um, right. I, and honestly, for me, like I had meditated like three months in a row and like the Headspace app was keeping track. Um, and like I cared that I had that record or that, that chain and it kept going. And then one day I just happened to forget I was doing a hackathon, which is like an all day thing. And so I just like got out of my routine and I broke it. And then since then, I've fallen off my meditation habit. So um, there really is something about the zero effect. Yeah. Like not breaking the chain. And kind of just like keeping inertia and you know like it at first you might say like oh like some number on an app is making you keep this habit like how silly are you but i think you know where i'm at in my life is if you find these little hacks that keep you doing things that are good for you then you should just <laughs> you should keep doing them no matter how silly they yeah mean. like where you know well there's also the, hack i don't know psychology it's... What's the thing called where it's like, um, well, I don't know if there's a name for it, but like observing a behavior, like can, um, encourage the behavior. Like there, like I heard about it in, in regards to health and that's what happened to me. Like once I got my Apple watch, it made me start yeah. working out. Yeah. Like I, really like I hadn't been working out at all. all. Yeah. And then like, yeah. I've heard some, uh, some like fitness coaches, diet coaches talk about it where like, the first week they have their client, like they get a client and they're like, I cannot lose weight for the life of me. I keep trying blah, blah, blah. And the first week they're like, all right, don't worry about losing weight. Just track your food. Like just track it. And so we right. can get a baseline and then they lose weight the first week. Right. <laughs> just because somebody's right. observing them. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, br you, br you bring attention. I mean, so I got two thoughts for you guys. So the first is, um, uh, I, I think there, there's some pretty good, um, I think there's scientific suggestion that if like we're, we're led by reward, right. As humans, like that's our incentive system biologically. So if you do a behavior, um, your body, your body has motivated you to do that behavior because it's anticipating some sort of reward, whether typically dopamine, but maybe some serotonin. Right. And so then if you do the thing and you give the thing credence, then you get the reward. Right. And then, so that makes you more likely to do it. So that's sort of like a, like a biological backing for the Diderot effect. Um, so um, I think you can even think about in terms of activities, like if you're giving, if you're giving an activity or like a, a, a pattern of thought, a line of thought, like credence, and then your reward is re re rewarding with you, you with dopamine, you're, 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 you're literally making that neuronal connection ossified. You're hardening that and making it more likely that that connection will fire. Like there, I think there's some pithy um, yeah. platitude, which is, um, neurons that fire together, fire together. Wire together. Yeah. yeah so yeah, um and, and and that's tricky right like that that's a that's a that's a, a biological change 
Like when people talk about like their biological changes that comes with drug addiction, like that, that, that's tough. So you need to be minimalist and you need to, you need to be thinking about things that are absolutely ne necessary and generative for you. And you need to be absolutely ruthless about ensuring you're not thinking about unproductive shit. And one more thought I had is we're talking about sort of the, the quantified self um, and how, um, you know, measuring your behavior. So Chris, you're using, um, you're using meditation app. Uh, shake you're using Apple Watch for for exercise. Um, you know, becoming that quantified self may make it more likely you're to follow behavior. But there's a flip side to that, right? I was actually talking to some lads about it yesterday, which is um, by tracking that, it's much more likely you're not going to let yourself down because you're tracking these habits and you get just this like report card, right? And you want that report card to be good because the report card basically says um, you've either done well this week or you suck, right? And the problem is if you're trying to like live your life, for example, like, you know, I had a few drinks last night and I woke up this morning and I checked the aura ring and my sleep score was like a 64, right? And so right off the beginning of the day, I had this report card saying this day is going to suck. And then it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to an extent. So it's a double-edged sword. It leads your average behavior to be better. But then there's like a certain determinism that comes with it when you're not doing the right thing that can make you feel really shitty. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I totally, I, I, I totally I get that. Like people I've, avoid the cards, the score card, because they don't want to feel shitty when they do bad things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The self determining part. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, some. Go ahead. No, no, no. You, you pop off. I've ranted enough. No, I, I was gonna, I was gonna kind of steer it back. I wanted to uh, get your guys' take <laughs> on um, minimalism in terms of like your social life and your, 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 your social network. Oh, um, oh nice in relationships. Cause I thought this would be an interesting thing to, to, to go off on. Um, so basically my thought was like, you know, me, just me personally, I don't have a lot of people that I keep in touch with, you know, um, on a regular basis, but I feel that that, that because of that, I have, I have more time to like do productive things in my, in my person, you know, in my personal life and with work and things, but also that the relationships that I do nurture more are much more rewarding. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to get your guys take on minimalism in terms of your social life, kind of how it works as a lever. I think, uh, one thing to point out here about levers and minimalism is, yeah, we were focusing on like this, uh, parade of distribution, the cost of having things, but a lot of levers are multidimensional. So there's, there's, uh, there's multiple reasons why you get that they end up being useful or valuable to you. I think another thing about minimalism is when you have a relationship um, with anything, typically the more you have, the deeper you go in that relationship, you start getting disproportionately, like it, it gets disproportionately better. So with your relationships with people, like your best friend or your wife or, you know, your family tends to be for each amount of unit of time you put into it is way better than like just an acquaintance that, um, you, you know, you, you barely know, but you have some things in common. And so I think something there about minimalism is by constraining the number of people you have really keep in touch with, you actually get way more of that camaraderie and like love out of it because each, each additional unit of time that you put into that relationship, you get disproportionately more like uh, positive feelings. That's not to say that you shouldn't, you know, have acquaintances and, and friends. I think you should be open to that. But being conscious of like spending time with your family versus maybe going out and just meeting random people uh, that you're probably never likely to like um, see again. Like you should be cognizant of when you're doing that and realizing that you're not necessarily investing in relationships that matter. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think the you know, compound interest is an incredibly powerful force, and if you're not if you're not using it to your advantage, you're you're not doing it right. Um, but I mean, it's also tricky, right? Like, like we're all we're all 26 age, and I think we have an idea of which of the acquaintances in our life um, will generate the most meaning for us. Um, but it's also tricky. Like, I feel like when you're younger there's the difference between ex explore and exploit, right? So we're talking about how we have these meaningful relationships today. And 
exploit is the wrong word, but we invest in those because they're going to give disproportionately great returns to um, to like love and, and meaning. Um, but when you're younger, right, you don't have those yet. So you're you're trying to meet a whole bunch of different people, try to figure out who you are, trying to figure out who other people are, and find a value match. But I think when you when you when you grow into yourself as a man or a woman, and you have an idea of what your um, unalienable value set is, it's kind of like if someone else doesn't fit with that value set, like it's it's just not gonna you're going to have trouble developing a super deep relationship because the first principle is is off from, from there. So, um, I mean, it, it's interesting, right? Like right now I'm, I'm sort of like confined, um, to upstate New York cause I find it's a lot easier to think. So I'm not like in the chaos and the randomness of the city, like a whole bunch of young people are, but, um, I know which people are super important to me and I make sure that I go see them like family and friends. Um, like at a fairly expensive cost because, you know, those, those relationships are, are critical. Um, the explore and exploit is like a famous for our listeners is a famous kind of mental model in computer science and making decisions on, under uncertainty. So um, it comes from this idea. If you're like an agent in an environment where you can take certain actions and you don't know basically the results of those actions, uh, What's recommended is in the beginning, you do explore, you explore a lot, you take random actions and you get, you get a sense of the territory, a map for the territory. And then, um, as you, as time progresses, you get, uh, progressively more exploitative, which means you just do what you know, makes the most sense and it's most valuable. Um, and so the word exploit sounds kind of negative, you know, like we don't use that word It's a very engineering word, but it doesn't really mean anything negative. If, when we use it like that, it just means exploit in this sense, in this mental model, just means doing what you know has the highest expected value. Um, and I actually, I mean, explore, exploit is probably one of my top mental models, um, just because so much of life is about operating in this um, space of the unknown. Um, and actually, explore and exploit also comes up in reinforcement learning, which is like a branch of psychology and uh, machine learning. Um, so you have a computer that's trying to learn how to operate in a space and it needs to take these moves, same thing I just described. And what actually, one thing that they found works really well is that you basically, well, it's called like uh, epsilon greedy. Greedy is the same as exploiting, which you just do what's best. But some epsilon amount of the time, you just take a random action. Um, and the reason you just continually take a random action is you want that, like kind of teacher saying like, you want that possibility of finding something new that you didn't know about um and so it actually comes it's interesting with minimalism it's like with your relationships probably most of the time you should just spend time with your family and your close friends but then some small amount of the time you should uh you should go like into the city talk to random people go to random house parties get that spontaneity um and so I think it's it's uh it's interesting to keep that in mind um that kind of framework it's like uh yeah you want you want to go with who who's be, like your your best mates but you also want that spontaneity right um which uh Nassim Taleb has talked about is like a barbell um where you you kind of want to do when you you could like spend an equal amount of time with everyone you know and that would again be an even distribution or what you could do is you could spend a lot of time with the people you really care about and then also be radically like talking to random people every chance you can. Yeah. And so yeah. like you kind of get the both the best of both sides where you're like really catering to your best relationships, but then you're also simultaneously like super open to spontaneity. Like talk to every Uber yeah. driver, every cashier, it's all, like just, you just fucking dive in. Yeah. <laughs> just, just it almost... leap 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 into the chaos. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like all these, you know, investment firms and like individuals who are like, I'll have like 3% exposure to Bitcoin. It's like, they're like, I <laughs> right. need to have like, it's almost like that. Exactly. It's like, you need like some exposure to like the volatility of life. You know, if, if you're like yeah. only hanging out with like the people, you know, best at the coffee shop, you know, the best, like, you know, it's, yeah, it's good. Yeah. I really like that. Also, also, also on, on that note of, of volatility, right. Um, some of the most, I mean, really well, some of the most um, colloquial financial levers 
are those that benefit directly from volatility. So you have a lot of these firms where they'll have a Pareto distribution in their allocation of assets under management, right? So 80% of it will be in relatively safe, modest risk assets. And then 20% will be in these leveraged assets that benefit directly from chaos, uncertainty, volatility of the world, right? So, um, especially James Clear. So. <laughs> A financial option allows this. So a financial option gives you um, the right, but not the obligation to buy a certain set of shares, for example, at a certain price. And one of the factors that goes into determining what the price of that option is, is this idea of implied volatility. How, how volatile the market is projected to be over the course of the investment. If the volatility, if the chaos and the uncertainty of the world goes up, the value of that option goes up. So it's this sort of leverage instrument. Also, Nassim Taleb, it's the idea there of, 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 of an anti-fragility, right? If something benefits from uncertainty, if it gets stronger when there's chaos in the world, it's said to be anti-fragile, which is better than robust. Robust is just a resilience against breakage. Um, but the idea of anti-fragility is a system, a system that benefits from stress. So like, I mean, we can plug some examples like capitalism, right? Like 2008 hit, everything imploded, but then all these incredible companies came out the other side, you know, Slack, Airbnb. Um, so that's an anti-fragile system or even populism, right? Like the more chaotic things get, um, the more people blame the elites and are likely to revolt. Immune system. Like you Immune system, yes. Please. Teach. You, you can explain. I know it's anti-fragile. I can't explain it, though. <laughs> yeah, it's just I mean, like the, the idea that, you know, like a, a lot of parents would like, you know, they'll, 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 they'll cuss it and protect their kids against like just random exposure to pathogens and germs and they'll have them wash their hands all the time. And what that does is it engenders like a fragility because it doesn't allow the immune system to 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 be tested, to do what it's supposed to do, to you know, give it reps in the real world, to practice for when something more serious comes along. So then COVID comes along, and if you've been one of those people that's, that hasn't had to fight pathogens, your immune system hasn't built any strength, then something as serious as that pathogen is gonna just wreak havoc on you. Um, but the way the immune system works is, it does benefit from that exposure, it builds strength. And I, I think that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, another another life lesson for me in the last couple of weeks is you just don't want to bet against volatility. I was I, I got kind of cute and bought puts on GME. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I've gonna ask been, you that. I've just I've I've been plump, plump I've been pummeled pummeled whatever the word is, and so sozzled sozzled I'm sozzled off these puts. <laughs> so I I'm sorry Wall Street bets. I, th I thought it was definitely going to die. And you've, you've told me don't bet against the memes in the ball. Um, well, hey, man, when I was learning um, on Bybit, I longed Bitcoin 100x, made a bunch of money. Then I shorted it 100x <laughs> and it kept going up. So I learned a tough lesson. Don't short Bitcoin in a damn bull run. <laughs> yeah, I think in general. I don't know what I was thinking. You don't want to be, you 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 be you shorting you things. <laughs> Actually, but then I did you, it again. You, you don't. You don't want to be shorting things. That's don't absolutely right. Yeah. You want don't to be long on life. Dude, I like that attitude, man. I mean, even 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 a, like a like that's a problem, right? Like a short, you enter, enter into a short position, and your maximum return is if the thing, the underlying, goes to zero, which is an one hundred percent return. Yeah. If you go long, your return's infinity. So going long is another form of leverage. Going short, you're just cucking yourself. Yeah. yeah. Short. Yeah, being short something is, I mean, hope, well, yeah, being short something is when you expect the price of something to go down, um, and and stonks only go up. So, so <laughs> life life only life is a stonk and it only goes up. So, don't buy puts. Um, if you take one thing away from the minimalism podcast, don't buy. Don't I actually I actually stonks. heard this. Uh, I was listening to that Naval How to Get Rich Again on the way here, and like. I, I kind of had forgotten this about this part where he talks about how like it's like it's logical to be optimistic. Like it's like the rational thing to do is to be optimistic about life and like specifically like business opportunities and how he talked about, you know, in Silicon Valley, like like these VC firms have like learned to like 
not doubt anything and just be like, in the off chance this thing blows up, like we might as well, you know, benefit from it because the cost of like it, you know, going bankrupt is not that bad in the long scheme of things, but like the upside is infinity. Right. Kind of like what you guys are saying. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think Dude, um, I I'm I'm so amazed at like how many topics like we can like I don't know. I'm just excited for this podcast, man, because everything we talk about in each of us like sparks all these, you know, tangential ideas and stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. Hopefully James clear when he's listening to this, we inspire his next <laughs> book. <laughs> Naval too. You know. James clear is going to use this for his next book. He's going to, this is going to be his source material for his next book. Yeah. He's like, Oh, I really like the idea of getting Soswald. <laughs> It's gonna be step five in the habit, the habit wheel. One trigger, two response, three get sozzled. <laughs> um, I think another thing about minimalism that we haven't talked about. I mean, it, we've we've kind of stretched and out minimalism. People just usually think it's about not owning things, but we've kind of made it just like this uh, simplicity and like you know having a relationship with less. I think another mm -hmm. thing is just, yeah, optionality and the freedom it gives you, which again, coming back to explore exploit is more important early in your life. Like for my parents having a bunch of stuff, they're not moving a bunch, so it's not as big a deal. But I mean, when you're young and you're exploring, trying to do new things, I think not having that like baggage on you, like figuratively and physically. Um, I wonder if that's where the figurative meaning comes from. Not having that baggage on you, just like gives you an ability to like move across the country or go somewhere new. Right. Um, right. And at this stage in our life, like I think it's important to maintain that. So minimalism is about having a relationship with less in that relationship with less. Uh, you actually get more out of the fewer things you're interacting with. That can be your property, your relationships, um, just like the mental space that you uh, kind of are swimming in. And that is a lever, which we talked about, which is, you know, given an input, a certain amount of force, you get this disproportionate output um, force. And so by living with less, um, you get more from the things you live with. Uh, so that's the first lever we've discussed. We're gonna go into all types of levers, whereas we keep exploring them in our own lives and um we're really excited uh for all the listeners that tuned in especially james clear so. 